My name is Andy Asimis, and I am the Vice President of the Auxiliary Board for C2ST. Um, thank you guys all for being here tonight. I hope that you're just as excited as I am about the program that we're about to see. Um, I'd like to start out by saying a big thank you to the Chicago Public Library for having us here tonight. C2ST is very pleased to continue our collaboration with the Chicago Public Library uh, with tonight's program, and we hope to do so well into the future. Tonight's program is presented to you by C2ST, the Chicago Department of Innovation and Technology, Argonne National Lab, and the Chicago Public Library. For those of you that are new to C2ST, we are a not-for-profit organization that seeks to enhance the public's understanding and appreciation of science and technology and their impact on society. C2ST has been hosting programs in Chicago for over a decade, and we host about 30 free or low-cost programs throughout the year on any and all science and technology topics. You can sign up to receive updates on upcoming programs at c2st.org, or you can sign up um, at the table in the atrium there. Um, as always, your support is vital to our programming efforts and they, your support allows us to keep events free or low cost. So please consider helping us elevate awareness of Chicago's great science by making a small $10 donation. Um, I also wanna say thank you to our partner organization, Argonne. With employees from more than 60 nations, Argonne National Laboratory is managed by UChicago Argonne LLC for the US Department of Energy's Office of Science. Argonne is a multidisciplinary science and engineering research center where talented scientists and engineers work together to answer the biggest questions facing humanity, from how to obtain affordable, clean energy to protecting ourselves and our environment. A couple housekeeping notes. If you could please silence your cell phones, um, we want to encourage you to take pictures, post, and live tweet throughout the event tonight, but we don't want any sound interruptions. During the Q&A, please respect those with hearing disabilities and wait for the microphone when you want to ask a question. Also, please use the conference app by typing, uh, as noted here, c2st.cnf.io into your phone browser. There, you can ask questions anonymously throughout the talk, and then you can also evaluate the program at the end. Okay, so without further ado, I would like to introduce our speakers for this evening. Charlie Catlett is director of the Urban Center for Computation and Data, a research center at the University of Chicago. He is also a supercomputer scientist at Argonne National Lab. Charlie has been involved in the internet and supercomputing for 35 years. He was chief technology officer at the National Center for Supercomputing Applications prior to, join, to joining Argonne and the University of Chicago in 2000. From 2007 to 2010, he was Chief Information Officer for Argonne National Laboratory, where he led initiatives in cybersecurity and privacy operations and research. He is currently the leader of the Array, Array of Things project. Welcome, Charlie. <laughs> Our second speaker is Danielle Dumer, who is CIO and Commissioner of the City of Chicago's Department of, Innova of Innovation and Technology, where she is working to improve how residents interact with government by creating more responsive and accessible digital services. Danielle brings over 10 years experience in government tech, having served as the city's CTO and leading data, digital inclusion, and other strategic initiatives. In 2016, Danielle and her team were recognized by the Chicago chapters of SIM and AITP as the most effective IT team in a large company. Welcome to both of our speakers, and we look forward to hearing from you. Every day, thousands of Illinois residents live with the uncertainty of lupus, an unpredictable and often disabling disease that can affect virtually any system in the body. Although there is no cure and few treatments, there is help. The Lupus Society of Illinois provides personal support to people living with lupus and those that care about them. With the help of informed volunteers, lupus medical experts, and a caring community, we support research and conduct educational programs so everyone affected by lupus can have an improved quality of life. We provide information to ensure people with lupus and their families get answers and health professionals know about new means to diagnose and manage the disease. For more information, please visit our website. Hello, 
thanks for coming. Good evening. Uh, so Danielle and I uh, have a little bit of a tag team going here, uh, which we've done a few times. Um, I, I thought about changing the slide order just to throw her off, but I decided to stick with the regular order. Uh, so I'll talk a little bit about uh, the project, and, and we'll both kind of talk about why we're doing the project. And then I want to just dive in a little bit to the science that we're trying to support and some of the computer science that's embedded inside this device here. And then we'll talk about how we've engaged the, um, the general public uh, and uh, what sort of things we've been doing with, uh, with students. And then finally, we'll talk about what, what happens uh, next with the project. So just uh, out of curiosity, how many people have seen one of these up on poles in Chicago? Uh, so you've seen them, good. So there are about 100 of them up right now, and we've got a map that'll, that'll give a little more information about that. So first thing we should explain is why this is called the Array of Things. And I have to say, it was an internal name that we had sort of stuck, but the idea was the, uh, one of the things that has been happening over the last 10 years is something called the Internet of Things, which simply means computing and communication um, and memory are getting smaller and smaller and cheaper and cheaper to the point that you could actually put things like this chair on the internet, uh, which sounds like a kind of a crazy idea, but if you think about something like uh, a medical cart going through a hospital, you do want to keep track of even simple things like a medical cart. Uh, and then the notion of an array telescope, which is an instrument that has many devices that are identical, but when you point them all in a particular direction, they can collectively see deeper and in more detail than just one of them could do. So we had this idea of using Internet of Things technology to build a array telescope, but to point it down at the city rather than uh, up at the stars. And there were a couple things that we set out uh, to do. And when I say we, I guess I should step back and say this is a partnership that uh, began something like eight years ago uh, between Argonne National Laboratory, the University of Chicago, and the city of Chicago. And although Danielle wasn't the CIO at that point, she was in the room the entire time uh, in various roles. So the two of us have been working on this for quite some time. And there were a couple of things we wanted to be able to do with these devices. Um, having decided that it might make sense for the city of Chicago to put a whole bunch of devices on poles, we set out about uh, in 2013 having scientific workshops to ask scientists the question, if we could place a device up on poles, and many of them throughout a city, what sort of measurements would you want or what functionality would you want for that device to be useful to the kind of questions that you're asking? And as I'll show in a moment, every one of the sensors and capabilities in this device have derived from those conversations with scientists or in some cases the people that work for the city of Chicago. And I should say that around the same time, the city launched its first ever technology plan. And in that plan, one of the things, the major strategies that were set out was to use Chicago as a test bed to develop new technology. So focusing on things like the array of things, advanced wireless networks, advanced manufacturing. So how can we leverage the city and not just all, in all of the great research institutions and universities we have here to really build new technology and make a Chicago a hub for techno technological innovation? Yeah, so in addition to the institutions you see with logos there, there were people from probably 35 or 40 universities and several national laboratories that had input into what this device would do. And what you see on the screen here are two different th things that we wanted to do. On the left-hand side, the most obvious to me anyway early on was, if you look at that, uh, that is a picture of the EPA air quality sites. If you look at that picture, you can see vast areas of the city that have no air quality measurement. And so we said, gee, sensors are getting cheaper and better just like consumer electronics are getting cheaper and better. So we should be able to build a device that instead of costing $100,000 like the EPA sites, might cost a few thousand dollars, but we could put hundreds of them around the city. And as we began talking with social scientists and transportation researchers, 
They said, well, for the things we want to measure, you can't really buy an electronic sensor. So we need to be able to look at a scene and analyze that scene. And, and that meant on the right-hand side that we had to build a device that not only had cameras and a microphone, we'll explain in a moment what we do with those, but also because some folks wanted to do research in smarter infrastructure, like a smart intersection that might react in real time, we had to do all the computing out on the pole. So inside here are programmable computers in order to support that kind of research. And I want to emphasize this is a research instrument. This isn't a smart city project or smart city product. It's rather a, a platform on top of which different scientists can do experiments. And of course, it produces data that can be used by scientists or anyone in this room, any, anyone in the general public. And by the city and by our communities to help problem solve around some of the things that Charlie's already talked about. Um, we'll talk about more in a bit. Yeah, so if you think at, at a certain level, there are three things that we're trying to do with, with this platform. The first is on the left-hand side on that previous graph, we want to be able to put a much better system in place to collect data about how the city's working, air quality, vibration, sound, uh, and much higher spatial and temporal resolution than, than could be done before. To do that, we have to use experimental sensors. And so on the upper right of this slide, you see that some of the designs that went into this um, anticipate that every year or two we'll say, gee, there's a much better carbon monoxide sensor, a much better sound sensor that we could put in there. And so we designed the platform and the partnership that the city and Argonne and UChicago designed together so that we would place devices out rather than uh, several hundred at a time, we would place them out in waves of a hundred at a time and we would design that device there so that the electricians, when they put this up on a pole, they could swap it out in about 10 or 15 minutes. And our Department of Transportation has been a great partner in this project, helping to provide feedback to Charlie and the team as they were developing this so that it is easy to mount on poles throughout the city and that they can do it rather quickly um, throughout the year. Yes, so the, the CDOT electricians have taught us a lot about city infrastructure. Uh, in one of our earlier meetings, um, we said, we were hoping to put these around six feet off the ground. And they said, hmm, why do you want to be that low? And we said, we, we want people to be able to interact with these devices, put buttons on them, things like that. And as soon as they all stopped laughing, they explained to us that the kind of interaction that, was, that we would get was probably not what we had in mind. So, so these are 20 feet up. One of the reasons they're 20 feet up um, is, first of all, we didn't want people to bump their heads. But, Second of all, the camera that's pointed down out of the white, hand, white uh, part on the, on, the, on the side there, that camera gets a full, uh, as it's 20 feet up, you get a full view of an entire intersection or, or whatever park area that you want to point that at. So we can do a lot more with respect to image an analysis if we're, if we're farther up. And it, it protects us from some of the interactions that they, they were talking about. And gets us data that the Department of Transportation will, will be using. And you saw at the bottom there, this, this third, uh, uh, the third reason or the third purpose of this device is to use that image processing capability to better understand the activities on the ground. Like uh, uh, we've been talking with the Chicago Park District about placing some of these along the lakefront uh, trail so they could get statistics that they have no other way of getting, which is how many bikes go by on a given day on, on the trail or how... How many people are using uh, using this this new park? Our, our Department of Fleet and Facility Management, who manages the Chicago's River Walk, they're also interested in collecting information. Now that we've been developing the River Walk as an open park and place for for people to to dine and enjoy the river. So I um, I mentioned earlier that we've had workshops with different scientists. We've had a number of different meetings with individual departments and agencies in the city and with, with leaders from across the, across the organization. And, and what you see on this slide here are the things that people wanted to be able to measure in order to meet the challenges that they had uh, with their jobs in the city or to answer the questions that they had about, uh, about cities. Uh, and then 
oops, yeah, and, the, and then um, the actual sensors that we use to get that information. So as an example, you can see, um, you can see we have uh, 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 ambient UV infrared light. And we also have a camera that's pointed straight up. So there's a little dome on top of this, some you might be able to see. And there's a camera and light sensors looking straight up. Um, that's one of the reasons we have that, is that people who are studying building energy efficiency were interested in having a measurement of solar load on buildings. And if these are sprinkled throughout the city, that's much better information than just general, uh, general weather. And then with that upward facing camera, even energy companies are interested in cloud cover uh, to be able to predict what they should expect from solar panels that people might have, uh, might have installed. Another one that uh, early on people said, well, gee, why do you need a temperature sensor on every block of the city or humidity? We get that from weather underground. Well, the gas sensors that we're using for air quality need to know exactly what the temperature and humidity is at the point of measurement because they respond differently based on temperature or humidity. So some of these sensors are maybe not necessarily adding something we don't already have, like temperature, humidity, or barometric pressure, but are necessary to inform the measurements of the other sensors. Uh, a little bit here on the, on the technology inside, um, Argonne, over the last five or six years, we've had a team at Argonne that's um, focused on pushing high-performance computing out into small packages and doing that in such a way that they can survive in harsh conditions for very long periods of time. When we have the Department of Transportation go out and put one of these up on a pole, that's a fairly large investment of time for those crews and it's not feasible with hundreds of these around the city to ask them to go out and hit a reset button or go back up the pole and and swap something out because it's broken. So we've spent a lot of effort over the last few years of designing into these devices a level of resilience and fault tolerance. So uh, as an example, the board that you see on, on the slide here is a board that we designed that controls the device and the two programmable computers that are inside the device. So how many people have a programmable computer that they use? Everyone, right? So um, if I said that uh, if I asked you if that computer would stay reliably up and running for two years, um, most of you would say, well, not so far. <laughs> um, because these are unreliable devices, un unlike some of the microprocessors that are very simple. So in this board here, we have a very simple microprocessor, but it's also very rugged, um, and you program it once. And we've built that device so that it keeps the two programmable devices healthy. So when we have a software load that goes out that corrupts the file system and makes the computer so it can't boot anymore, that little device there can rebuild that, that system. So that was an important part of the design. And, um, the other, as we've mentioned a few times, this notion of looking at images and sound. You see a couple of examples up there. One is, uh, so right now every 30 seconds, these devices send all their data back to the database. Uh, and one of the things they send is the number of vehicles that they see in, they analyze an image every 30 seconds. And the other is how many pedestrians they see. We have an experiment that we're doing with a couple of nodes that are near Soldier Field in the upper right hand side there to be able to detect overflying drones. Something that events at Soldier Field, you'd sort of want to know that there was a drone coming in. So, so there's a lot that we can do with those, uh, with those, uh, those cameras. And as I mentioned, all the data is open, uh, and we've, we've been working with Danielle's team to, to put the data into a form that is legible to residents. Yeah, so all of the data is available. If you go to arrayofthings.org, first of all, you can see a map of where all the nodes are across the city. The other thing you can get to is the data. So you can download that data in bulk. Um, or you can use an application programming interface. And so one of the things that my team is going to be working on this year is making, taking some of that information and iterating with communities, um, developer communities, as well as um, you know, residents, what is going to be useful to put up on the city's data portal. Um, for example, in dashboards, what, how do people want to use this and access this information so they can get a snapshot of what's happening in their neighborhood? 
And then we'll also work on using those APIs, those application programming interfaces, to integrate some of that information into city systems. So for example, another use case that um, they're working on is the identification of standing water. Um, so if we can find that at these intersections, then how can we use that information so that the Department of Water Management can deploy resources and establish a process where that information then kicks off something automatically in our 311 non-emergency management system so that they can take appropriate action. You can also see at the bottom of the page there, so if you go to the Array of Things website, and it's just arrayofthings.org, and look for map and data, uh, you can get to the data, as Danielle said, the data that's bulk download is within 24 hours. We update it every day in the middle of the night. But the API, the application programming interface, lets you have data that's maybe three minutes old. So it's, it's almost real time. We have a lot of developers that are developing applications using that data. But in the middle there, um, there are these tutorials and tools at the website as well. So um, if you are so inclined and you want to learn how to program in Python or R, there's actually a tutorial that you can learn how to find the array of things data you're interested in and pull it down uh, and, and analyze it in some fashion. So, and those tutorials are not aimed at computer scientists or mathematicians, but uh, we actually tried to aim them at, a, say, a typical high school, uh, high school student. And there'll be more tutorials and, 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 uh, and tools over time. So a big part of this project, of course, is the technology, but as big of a part of the project is how we have interacted institutionally among the partners and with the city of Chicago residents. Uh, and, and early on, uh, I think all of us understood that this kind of project would only be possible if it was a partnership with the residents of the city and not something that was imposed uh, on them. And so we've, we've spent a lot of effort in design of policies and things and, uh, uh, to that end. Yeah, so I think, you know, Charlie's already mentioned that a lot of the sensors in the node already, right? There's things measuring temperature and barometric pressure and, and, and you know, sound intensity. And uh, most of those things are fairly straightforward to our residents. But he also mentioned that there are, there is a microphone and there are cameras in this device. And since they are going out into the public way in our communities throughout the city, it was especially important that we think about how the devices would be used what kind of data would be collected, and how all of that would be governed. Um, so uh, before anything went out into a built environment, um, we consulted with, uh, you know, obviously with experts around privacy in particular. Um, the city has a network of cameras throughout the city that are managed by our Office of Emergency Management and Communications and support public safety. But that's not what this project was about. This project was a, is a research platform to, to find out uh, data that we haven't been able to easily collect and m different kinds of information that impact the livability of our communities. So um, with that in mind, we, we consulted with experts and explained we weren't interested in collecting personal identifiable information, but rather in answering some of these research questions or solving, helping to gain more data to, to uh, develop new interventions around issues like air quality or noise throughout the city. And so the privacy policy, they gave us some feedback and we drafted a privacy policy. So um, that policy, then we took that out to our residents and got their input as well. And we did that through a number of, of ways. Um, we had uh, in-person meetings where we explained what the project was, what the project wasn't, explained um, our process for managing the data uh, that essentially we wouldn't be collecting any or storing any personal identifiable information. So although there is a camera, we're interested in things like how many cars are there, how many pedestrians are there. We're not interested in capturing information about specific people or identifying specific people through this. So this is about general activities. And so we wrote all of this up in a way that we hoped was clear and then um, explained all of that and got input from residents both um, verbally and then as well via uh, feedback forms. We also used a platform that allowed um, residents to mark up the 
the policies themselves and give us input, which we then fed back into it. And so the privacy policy at the core, this idea that we, we respect personal privacy, that we don't want to store personal identifiable information, that's all at sort of the core of it. But the other important thing was how would we ensure that we were uh, uh, complying with that policy? So the governance around this was just as important. So there is a governance process, and, and the policy is also available at arrayofthings.org. So if you're interested in reviewing it, you can do so. But it also sets out essentially the governance bodies and the process by which we would uh, deploy new uses. So Charlie mentioned there's edge computing capabilities. If we can deploy over the air new algorithms to identify different things in the way, in the public way, how would we decide what those things would be? And so the governance, there is a, an executive oversight com uh, committee, which Charlie and I sh chair and have a number of experts on. There's also a science review group and a security and privacy review group. So the very first step in the process of, is if someone has a new idea of something they would like to introduce using the instrument, they would go to the science review group. And if it passes that muster, it goes to the security and privacy group who makes a determination about how this does or, or, or does not comply with the policies we've set forth. And then from there, there's recommendations made to the Executive Oversight Council who can then green light whether or not that use of the instrument can move forward. So we were very cognizant to make sure that we were setting up those, that kind of process and policy so that we were protecting our residents and ensuring that the data that was being collected is going to be used in service of our communities and in service of research that would support improving our cities all over the world. So all of the data that we send every 30 seconds uh, is free and open uh, through the mechanisms that we mentioned before. Uh, and can be repurposed as any open data can, uh, can be. The privacy policy that Danielle has just explained uh, with respect to personal data, um, we went further than was ethically or legally necessary, um, and we did that intentionally, uh, part because of the interest in having a partnership with the city and going beyond the minimum to the point where people were actually comfortable with what was happening. And partly because we, we know that technology is going to get better, and so we wanted to make sure that our policies weren't relying on some technical limitation that might go away at some point in the future. So for example, it would be very difficult to read a license plate or recognize a face in any of the images that we capture today. and so. In a sense, we could be publishing those, uh, those images without much danger of, of revealing somebody's privacy. Um, on the other hand, five years from now, three years from now, seven years from now, we'll have cameras that will be that powerful. And so we don't want to have to re reinvent the policy when that, when that happens. So right now, the policy is that we analyze the images inside the device, and then we delete the images. And what gets sent back every 30 seconds is not an image or a sound clip, but it's a number, like the number of pedestrians in the scene or the number of bikes or the number of, uh, of vehicles. Now, every few minutes, about every 15 minutes, we do capture one image from every one of these, and we store that into a protected database. And we do that, it's also part of the privacy policy, because we need to have a library of images that we can use to train the software to recognize certain things like standing water. So we need to have lots of images of different weather conditions, standing water, not standing water, so we can train that software to recognize standing water. Those images are protected and controlled so that any scientist that wants to use them has to sign an agreement about their use. So we protect those, uh, those as well. If we decide to change the privacy policy or add something to this device, like a LiDAR or, or a more, um, uh, a more high, high, higher resolution camera, that would go through this privacy review group and then the committee that Danielle and I co-chair would look at the recommendations from privacy and security people, the proposal to make the change, and then we as a group would decide uh, whether to approve that change. Anything that affects privacy, especially a change to the privacy policy, would then go back through this 
six-month comment period that we did for the first set of policies. So if you put input into the policies that are there now, you should know that if they do change or we propose to change them, you'll have another chance to have, have that kind of input. Absolutely, and that is, that's also defined in these policies, but our goal was to provide as many opportunities via as many channels as we could to our residents as we were drafting them to contribute to that, and we would do the same uh, should they change. Um, and I think... Can you talk about the ESG? Sure, so um, one, of the, one of the ways that um, residents can continue to engage with us through this project is by suggesting locations to us. Um, so we do get community suggestions, and uh, again, through that same website that we've talked about, you can suggest locations yourself. But how do we decide where things should go? So there's, there's this rule of three that we like to talk about, which is one, um, is there a, a research question that we're interested in exploring through um, one of the partnerships in, in the research institutions? Two, is there uh, an issue that the city is looking to solve or could have impact on helping to solve, um, such as flooding in our neighborhoods, for example. And three, does our, do our communities care about that issue? So for example, around air quality, um, some of the first nodes went into um, the areas of Pilsen and Little Village where we know that there are residents who had concerns about air quality, the city itself, obviously is interested in understanding what's happening there, and then the researchers likewise are interested in studying what's happening in that area. So collectively, everyone has an interest in gathering more data in those spaces. And so that's one of the, those are the ways we think through how to deploy these nodes throughout the city. Um, and, and it helps us also prioritize some of that as well. So what you see on this is the first 100 locations and we've kind of grouped them according to the reason that we chose those areas. Uh, it's also the case that every one of the devices that are out there is identical, and so we're still getting air quality even if we put them uh, in places we're looking uh, for, for transportation. Uh, so this is a science forum, right? So let me talk a little bit about the science that, that we are enabling here. You see a picture at the bottom of these uh, uh, first uh, full-scale user workshop that we did last uh, last August uh, out at Argonne uh, and some pictures from that workshop where we had uh, about 15 different scientists stand up and give what we call lightning talks, just a five-minute or ten-minute talk on the kinds of things that they're either already doing with this experimental instrument or the things that they were hoping to do uh, as we as we move down the road. And these were scientists not just from Argonne and New Chicago, but from 30 plus institutions really around the world. So the other thing that uh, many people ask us, and certainly folks like you that are here talking about science might have thought, oh, you're using a new type of sensor for air quality. How do you know that that's not just a random noise generator? How do you know it's actually telling you something uh, about air quality and not um, uh, and not totally totally off. So there are a couple ways that we've been uh, addressing the characterization and the validation of those air quality uh, sensor uh, uh, values. So one is you can see on here the Cook County EPA and, and federal and state EPA sites, those, those yellow diamonds. And at one of them so far, but we hope to increase that over the next, as we pu push the next 100 out, We've been uh, taking the data right next to the EPA, uh, EPA's instruments, and doing comparisons. And so on the upper right-hand side, you see this scatter plot uh, where in the vertical is the, I think that's ozone, uh, in the vertical is what we're measuring with the Array of Things sensor, and horizontal is what we're measuring with the EPA sensor. And if we were always measuring exactly the same value, then we would have this straight line up and to the right. So that variation from that diagonal tells you how far off those sensors are. So with that sort of data, we can say, well, the ozone data is pretty good. Uh, it's going to be plus or minus 10, 10 percent or so. Uh, and so we're doing that with each one of the air quality sensors. The other thing that we're doing is um, there are satellites that uh, provide data. There's one called Tropomi that every day at about 1.30, 
flies over uh, and it, it will measure several of the gases that we measure like ozone. And so we're comparing with satellite data, which is not an apples to apples because the satellite data for ozone, for example, is how much ozone's in the entire atmosphere and we're measuring at 22 feet. So we've got to use computational models to do that sort of thing. Next year, or maybe 18 months from now, a new satellite will go up that's geosynchronous, geostationary, and so it will every hour give us not just the data that we get from Tropomi, but data and twice the resolution of this. So those are five by, I think it's five by eight kilometer measurement areas, and we'll have a three by five from, from this new satellite. I should also mention that this, this map here was drawn by our Spatial Data Science Center at UChicago uh, in response to my asking them, if I'm a resident in the city of Chicago, how far is the closest array of things node from me? And so you see a one kilometer and two kilometer buffer around all the nodes. With just the first 60 that went up, we were within, 42, within uh, two kilometers of 42% of the population, within one kilometer of 80%. And so when we're looking at the next 100, the blue ones, we said, let's see how far we can push those numbers. And we think we can get up to about 70% of residents living within one kilometer of a node. And now air quality and sound kind of mean something. And almost everyone in the city will be within, within two kilometers of a node. Now, it's not just university and national laboratory scientists that we've engaged. You see here at the bottom is a picture of uh, one of our summer teams, we have had summer teams the last six years working on the project. Those are mostly uh, undergraduate students. You can see a couple of old folks on there, but mostly undergraduate and graduate students. Uh, and then in the upper left there, you see high school students from Lane Technical High School. Now at, at Argonne, we have a program every summer uh, where we bring in about 400 undergraduates, and this is a sampling from those that work with our team. Uh, but this year we started a high school program as well where students came out and we did this for one day a week with these high school students. But the ones in the picture there are from Lane Technical High School in a, in a curriculum that, uh, that we started called Lane of Things. I don't know if you want to... Sure. So um, in partnership with Jeff Solon, who's a computer science teacher at Lane Tech, as well as Doug Pankos from the School of the Art Institute, and Kate kuziak galvin who's on uh, part of uh, Charlie's team, they developed curriculum to teach high school students how to build these, these sensors and to come up with questions um, that, and project ideas uh, that they, you know, questions they want to ask either within their school or most recently through a partnership with the Chicago Cubs. So they worked with a client who had various questions and they were able to build some, some basic sensors, sentiment uh, sensors, I believe, you know, uh, judging how people uh, felt about um, the, the happy, sad, the happy, sad faces. Um, and so this, this curriculum then, uh, they've been doing this at Lane, Lane Tech for the last few years. And one of the great things that um, in the past year they were able to do is actually uh, expand, take that curriculum and train other teachers so that this curriculum can be taught at other high schools throughout the area. So um, it's a it's great uh, opportunity to engage our Chicago students and build, help build that tech pipeline of interest in these areas of advanced technology. Yeah, this is, uh, we're now in the fourth year of this program, and it's been funded all four years by the Motorola Foundation. Um, there's been about 400 students so far. I don't know how many are enrolled this year, uh, but as Danielle said, we, we now have, I think it's six schools in Chicago, some middle and some high schools that are trying out the curriculum this year, or parts of the curriculum, uh, to see if it will, will fit into what they're doing. So maybe what we'll do is kind of close with uh, what's happening outside of Chicago. This project has generated a lot of sort of buzz about, uh, about the city and a lot of interest from, from others around the world. And what you see here are, uh, the yellow ones are just conversations that have started over the last year or two with different, sometimes it's somebody from a city, sometimes it's somebody from a university. And uh, we've chosen from all of these contacts a set of, partners based sort of on the rule of three that Danielle uh, mentioned. We, we want to make sure before we do a partnership where they're actually uh, reimbursing us for the cost of nodes that we send them, 
Um, we want to make sure they have a science question or a policy question for which this instrument can actually provide useful data and not just that they're looking to put something shiny and, and beautiful up on the pole. And um, I should have been mentioned, by the way, this beautiful design is also from Doug Pankos at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. Don't you think it's nice looking? Is it just me? <laughs> um, so so the, there are installations underway. You can see them there, the green ones. Um, and and uh, besides the science or policy question, we also have said with, you know, as much as I love Danielle and the city of Chicago, it's a lot of time uh, to keep the relationships uh, going and the communication between a research group and a, and a large organization like a city. And we can't possibly keep that up with cities around the world. So we have uh, also said we're only going to do partnerships with universities or national laboratories in these places. Uh, so that they can do that interface with their local city, which makes sense anyway. Uh, the, the red ones are probably going to go out, and actually the Nashville nodes, I think, shipped this week. We have a, van a manufacturer for this that's out in Glendale Heights called Surya Electronics, uh, and they now have taken over all of the manufacturing for us. So we, we ordered 100 for the city of Chicago that have just finished coming out of the factory, and another 50 for these... Uh, uh, blue and red partners there, and um, and we expect that that'll uh, that'll continue to grow over the next uh, uh, year or so. So uh, that's what we're doing. That's where we're going, and we wanted to make sure there was time for uh, for questions. So yeah, I mean, I think the last thing I would say is we'll continue to be engaging the community around this project over time, and I think um, with. And in particular, with use of the data now that, uh, you know, and we're starting internally by starting to use it more and so that we can go out and also help others within our community start to use it. At the National Kidney Foundation of Illinois, we provide free educational programs and support for individuals living with kidney disease and their families as well as continuing education programs for healthcare professionals and free kidney mobile screenings to Illinois residents who may be at risk for diabetes, high blood pressure, and kidney disease. We mean it when we say the National Kidney Foundation of Illinois improves the health and well-being of people at risk for or affected by kidney disease through prevention, education, and empowerment. For more information, please visit our website. The need to prevent and mitigate the impact of gun violence in Chicago has never been more urgent. At Strides for Peace, we know the numbers are staggering, with Chicago experiencing more gun violence and gun-related deaths than New York City and Los Angeles combined. While the headlines tell the story of rising violence, too often we overlook the assets on the ground working to stop it. Strides for Peace empowers and assists dedicated community organizations across Chicago that are providing future-focused and life-affirming alternatives to people every day. We believe in a Chicago where all can thrive and live free of the fear of gun violence. And by working together, we can change more than the narrative of our city. We can save lives. For more information, please visit our website. Then connect, commit, change. Be part of building peace in Chicago. Thank you. We have a, a microphone uh, if anyone has a question. Besides the air quality, what else have you learned that's of use to the residents of Chicago? So I think those are still things that were, still questions that we're asking, right? And I think that's where some of the engagement that I mentioned will be really important, because not, you know, while we've engaged already and we continue to, not everybody knows about the resource that's there. Nor does, uh, you know, so we, we want to make sure that we're providing tools that will make it easier to interact and to get that information. And that's why we think our data portal and some of the things, the visualizations we might be able to put up on our website will help make it more accessible to others. 
We also want to encourage other developers in our civic community, civic tech community, which is very vi vibrant, to start using that information and building some applications themselves. We we have our you know we have obviously um, uh, as a central IT organization we run the city's. Uh, uh, technology infrastructure, all of the enterprise applications we use, we're responsible for data management and analytics across the city and information security. So um, we know we can't build everything that we that might be of use to our residents, so that's why having connections with that civic tech community or you know, and even private sector uh, folks who might be interested in using that information is really important to continue to expand the utility of the tool. Um, but the you know there are a limited number of people who can use an application programming interface, and so that's why that next step of making it more accessible, I think, will will make a big impact. We have an online question: Are there similar projects in other large cities? If so, are um, if so, are data sets across analyzed in any way? I didn't hear the second part there. If there are other cities, uh, do you use the data from the different cities? Are we looking cities? At, at the same data elements across the different cities yet? Uh, there are some other efforts that are doing the sensor part of this. Um, there are very few efforts that are doing the computing out on the, on the edge, edge computing that we talk about. Uh, there's one group at Georgia Tech, there's another at Carnegie Mellon that are doing some similar things, but um, Array of Things is unique in that we actually compute inside the, the device. Um, now, for things like air quality, in fact, the 100 devices that are just starting to go up, the second 100 that are just starting to go up now, we chose the particulate matter sensor, PM 2.5, uh, which is a really important health measure. We chose that sensor in part through collaborations with other teams around the world who were measuring air quality, and specifically one in Taiwan at Academia Sinica there, where they have put 4,000 of the same air quality sensors out throughout the island of Taiwan and are able to, to animate PM 2.5 as it comes across from the mainland and comes down, down the island. And, uh, I just ha had a Skype call with uh, the leader of that project a couple weeks ago to talk about plans for the summer where we will be pulling their data and transforming it into the same format that we use, and they will be pulling our data uh, to start to look at um, all of that data in, in sort of one place. And as we've been talking with other projects that are doing measurements, uh, we've been encouraging them to at least include the, the basic metadata that you need, and most of them already do, so that we can uh, mix these data together. So as an example, every time we report, uh, say, ozone, we don't just say the ozone is this many parts per million. We say uh, on that measurement, there's the node ID from which we get the location. There's the date and time. There's the board that hosts that sensor and the firmware version of that board's processor. And then there's the raw reading of the sensor. And then finally, there's what we think that raw reading means in terms of parts per million, because we have to put that through a formula to translate a voltage or a current to a parts per, per million. And that way, if later we improve those algorithms, we can go back and, and, and improve the data. So, so these other projects, uh, I, I think most of them are are quite amenable to trying to come up with some way to translate between our projects. Uh, you mentioned you're working on dashboards uh, to visualize some of these data, and these data can be pretty complicated. How are you making decisions about um, how accessibly you want to show these data for experts or for a non-expert population? Yeah, so I think the only way to do that is to actually try mocking some things up and showing them to people um, with different skill levels, right, and different uh, understandings of the project even. Um, we uh, make it a point to, to interact directly with residents when we're developing some of these tools. Um, there is a group called the Civic User Testing Group that we have often called upon to give us 
uh, early input into these things. What would, you know, starting from like the design of it, what will be useful to you? Um, how would you want to see that to actually looking at it and giving us input? Um, we did that most recently with our new 311 system, which we just launched. So this is another, um, another area where directly getting, asking people what they think will be really important and taking feedback. So we know we won't be able to get everyone's voices before we, we launch it, but we'll continue to get at feedback so that we can refine and improve it over time. Or if someone says, well, that's great, but wouldn't it be nice if you did X, Y, and Z? We'll take that input in, and then we can work that into, into um, later releases. All right, and we have another online question. Are there any applications to crime detection or apprehension? Um, well, if somebody wanted to use the open data, I suppose, but no. <laughs> and so the city does publish um, on its data portal, so at data city of cityofchicago.org, a lot of information about the city, including our crime data. Um, you know, for someone who's interested in doing analysis of that information along with any of the environmental information that's being captured here or um, activity information like traffic, et cetera, they could do that. Um, however, as I mentioned earlier, the Office of Emergency Management and Communication manages a network of cameras that are aimed specifically towards public safety. And so that that um, that network is really what where um, the police and, and the OEMC um, used to, to promote public safety. And the point of this project was to collect other information about our neighborhoods that we hadn't been collecting through those more traditional methods. Is there any benefit in, because I know buses are geolocated, is there any benefit in making those mobile? to attach, say, to the bus system or the transit system in general? Uh, yes, and there are projects that are, that have been doing that. It, um, we have some open offers from different groups in the city um, to put these on top of vehicles where they, they drive them around. But we have a fairly small engineering team, so we just, that's not come up to the top of the inbox yet. Um, Having said that, last summer, one of our student projects was to take just the air quality sensors and package them with GPS and a battery into a form about like this so that they could fit into the bike uh, water bottle holders. And so we prototyped that. We built 12 of them. And we're looking at that as, a, as an option to augment something like this, where obviously we're not going to get pedestrian and vehicle flow from that. But we might be able to get noise levels and, and air quality. Uh, so one could put that in a fixed location or, or in a mobile location. Hi. So I have a couple questions about the air quality monitor ring that you're doing with these. So it seems like earlier you said all of the, the um, sensors are identical, but it also seems like you're working, working in two different batches, the first 100 and the second 100. And it, it seems like the PM sensor that was put into the newer batch of the, the second 100 might be newer and different. So does the first 100 batch measure for PM 2.5 or is that only the newer batch? That's a good question. So. Um each batch is going to be more or less identical, but as we improve, uh, the new ones that go up will have different and, we hope, better sensors. And PM, uh, particulate matter, is uh, one that is different between the first 100 and these, these next ones. We intended to use a, a fairly expensive one that was around $500 and... Um, and so we were only going to be able to put those in a fraction of the of the first hundred, like twenty or thirty. I think actually we were targeting thirty or forty. Um, but early testing with this more expensive sensor, although it is a better sensor than what we're putting in, what are in the new ones, which cost around thirty dollars. It's also much more fragile, and we found that even just moving it and jostling it around and putting it on a bucket truck and then going up was enough to misalign the, the, uh, opt the optical components. 
and, and so they we would go up on a pole and we wouldn't get useful data out of them. So that was an experiment with that sensor that um, we learned from in the first round and then improved it in the second round. And I have no doubt that we'll do exactly the same thing, maybe not with a particulate matter sensor, but, but with other sensors. And then there are new sensors that we didn't get into this hundred, but we hope to get into the next one. Um, one is wind. We didn't want to have any moving parts, although there is one moving part, which is the fan inside the particulate matter sensor. But we've, we found a wind sensor that seems like it would work well and wouldn't make the installation too much more complicated. And we also will be adding a carbon dioxide sensor. Um, although for, for atmospheric scientists, uh, climate studies, the carbon dioxide sensors that you could put in a device like this really aren't appropriate because you want to know is is the concentration 407.5 or 408.3 and the ones that we can afford to put in these devices would start at around 400 par parts per million and go up to a couple thousand but the variation of carbon di dioxide in a city is fairly large so we wouldn't learn anything about the climate but we'd learn a lot about the atmosphere inside the city with that kind of sensor. Thank you. And is there a place that actually lists kind of what sensors you're actually working with within this? You can get that on the website. Um, I, I will be the first to admit our website appears to have been designed by scientists rather than <laughs> website designers. Uh, uh, but there is an email address that you can uh, you can get to us and, and we'll point you right at. There's a GitHub site, uh, which is an open source software site, and all of the sensors are at the GitHub site along with all their, their data sheets and all that. Are these sensors running 24 hours every day or are you mostly looking at certain peak times? Uh, 24 by seven. You were telling me, or you were telling us earlier uh, that there's both a streaming interface for the data and that the data is uploaded once a day uh, so, so I'm a database me, guy, so I'm interested in hearing about how it's persisted, what's your data governance, how long do you plan to keep it, and how are you potentially integrating with other sites? Uh, so every 30 seconds, each of these sends its data back to our, our database. Um, that's an internal database. Every day at midnight UTC, or Greenwich Mean Time, we will send 24 hours worth of data out to our public facing website and, and update the bulk data there. But every two or three minutes, we will send the data, we will send the, I think it's every three minutes we send the last 10 minutes worth of data out to a external system where the API is where you can access that fresh data. And we send an overlapping in case we miss some data. Uh, the API will probably end up I would say we'll probably end up only keeping a month or so of data there. Uh, the bulk data, we don't ever intend to delete that data. Uh, you talked a little bit about how you could calibrate the uh, accuracy of your um, air quality sensors, but you also talked about analyzing images, like how accurate are you at determining that's a car, that's a pedestrian, that's a bus, that's a bicycle? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, what we're, that happens in several steps. So the first is that we have some algorithm that somebody writes, and then we, we train it and test it on a set of images that we know whether there's, we know how many cars are in there or how many people. And then we can assess the effectiveness of that algorithm through that sort of testing in a controlled uh, conditions and then when they when they go out on the poles that uh, we push that algorithm out to the pole and it starts collecting data uh, we have to trust that our our initial evaluation is um, you know if the initial evaluation says well it's it's uh, plus or minus 10 percent so if it says eight cars maybe it's eight maybe it's seven maybe it's nine um, then that's how we would interpret the data uh, when I mentioned earlier that we we wanted to capture in these measurements not just what we think is happening but the raw sensor value, we obviously can't do that with the images and save all the images so you can go back. What we can do, though, 
is make sure that when there's a measurement of pedestrian count, in that measurement is a link that takes you to the algorithm that was used to make that decision. And so um, we can at least keep track of the algorithm that was, that was used. But it's a, um, it's a good question. How are you going to share scientific results to the public so they understand the value for investment? Well, uh, there are a variety of things that, that, we, that we do. This is a project that's funded by the National Science Foundation, and uh, one of the metrics for performance on those grants is your scientific publications. Uh, we try whenever, actually more often than we write a scientific journal publication paper, we will write something or be interviewed and, and participate in something that's aimed at the general public. So we try to keep a running dialogue, and when something new happens, we, we try to uh, uh, publish that. Yeah, and if it's research that they're doing in conjunction with the city, often, you know, for example, our Department of Public Health does a lot of different research partnerships. Our Department of you know, Family and Support Services, they have a lot of research partnerships. In general, the city does work a lot with academic institutions to do evaluations and studies. And so, the, you know, we work to publicize the results of those and help them to be understandable to our communities to the best that we can. Um, it seems like Chicago is an early adopter of this type of system, so that's really cool. Um, first question is, is there like a link on your site that has like a, um, like all the open source projects maybe that might be going on to use using this data. And then also I must uh, uh, I might have missed this, but like how many of these devices are currently out there and is the data already rolling in? Uh, what did you say right before the data already rolling in? How many? How many devices? So there are over a hundred I think right now, right? About a hundred? Um, uh, devices. Oh, oh, how many devices? Right? Yes, how many devices? About a hundred. Yeah, there are about a hundred, so um, the, the location of all the devices are actually on the city's data portal, so, um, and there, that, there's, like a, there's also a map view of that that's linked off of the main arrayofthings.org site um, that shows you exactly the location of where all of those are. Um, and then the other question, sorry, was... You know, is there um, a list of different open source projects, like GitHub projects, on your website somewhere? Um, there's a, so if we're doing the, the project, we have links to, to those projects. Um, we don't always know who's using the data. Uh, we would love to know who's using the data uh, because we'd like to report that to the National Science Foundation, to, to other stakeholders like, like the city. Um, what we have been doing is every time we hear about somebody that's using the data, we encourage them to, um, provide us with more information. So there should be, over time, a growing list of those at the website. But right now, it's a pretty short list. And part of that is because we only started publishing the data about six months ago. Uh, and uh, we haven't made a, a really big sort of marketing push to, to let people know it's there. We've been kind of heads down making sure that the data is meaningful and evaluating it. Um, and the API was only released, the uh, application programming interface, for, so people can write applications. That was only released a couple of months ago. So we're really at the kind of early stages. And any project like this, you really do want to know that list because it tells you something about the value of the project. We do keep track of how many requests we get for downloads and how many hits we get into the API, which kind of translates to, to, to some level of usage. But. That's one of the challenges, I think, with open data in general, is we publish you know, hundreds of data sets at the city, but we don't require you to uh, tell us about anything that you're doing with it. So it really is a, sort of a volunteer basis, right? So we, we have, um, you know, if you're, for example, if you use our Open311 API, if you're just reading the data, you don't have to sign up or to or you know to get a key, but if you wanted to write into our system, then we make you go through some testing and sign up. And so there are you know other applications like C Click Fix or something that feed into our 311 ecosystem, and then we make them get a production key so we know who's actually using that. But to read the information from an open data perspective, we don't we don't make those same kinds of requirements. 
So it's a challenge. We encourage everybody to tell us how they're using the information, whether it's array of things data or other data from our portal, because it's helpful to us to, to know who, who our users are and what those use cases are. We'll just uh, do two more questions. I'm pretty curious about those little beasties. Um, you, you might have a spec sheet somewhere, or some interesting facts that I wouldn't think of, but like, I'm curious about like how much power they take. Do you plug them into the poles? Are there, are there any batteries on board? How long they last? I think you said you put out about 100 of them and you were gonna do another 100. Are there any long-term plans that you would probably do a lot more over time, or is that gonna be enough? Things like that. Um, well, the the device right there will pull around 20 watts, um, so it's pulling about as much as if I plug my phone into the wall and charge it. It's not pulling a lot of data. It doesn't pull the same all the time. It it, um, it pulls more when it's transmitting. There's a cellular modem in the top of the the white dome, and and that's probably the thing that sp spends as much energy as as anything but the processors. Um, so they're line wired, and so they're powered all the time. Um, the modems every 30 seconds. Um, let's see, your, your other questions about... And they're separate, it's a separate power source from the poles that they're mounted on to, so it's not sharing the same power as the street lights, for example. So, so we have 100 now, we're putting another 100 out. Um, we are always in the midst of writing more proposals to federal agencies, Department of Energy, National Science Foundation. Um, I think that for a city like Chicago to, to, to do what we set out to do, I think a couple hundred is, is, is a good number, but I don't think that uh, every city around the world is gonna need 200 of, 300 of these. Um, the thing that I mentioned before, the, the device that is like this size that just does say sound and air quality, um, we may find, we'll do, we're planning some experiments to find it, that that might be something where you would have a, uh, we're, we're doing a project with Vanderbilt University in Nashville, and they're thinking they want to do like 40 of these, but maybe 200 of the smaller ones around their city, so. All right, and this is going to be our final question. I'm curious about the traffic. So uh, I can understand trying to get a tally on the number of pedestrians, bicycles, that kind of thing. What other type of stuff are you looking at beyond just pure congestion? Or? Sure. So one of the things we've talked about working with the researchers on is um, in support of uh, the Vision Zero initiative or we're reducing pedestrian deaths is um, right now we have data about crashes like that have happened. But how do we identify things that were near misses or other, other types of issues that we might not get through a crash data set? Um, and so that's one of the ways we were thinking about using both the microphone from noise capture uh, um, to the, the images to be able to train an algorithm to identify those things as well. So that's, a, that's another issue, the, the safety of uh, around that, the, those intersections and identifying um, intersections where there have been more issues so that we can collect different kinds of data than we currently have um, today. Yeah, that's part of, so part of the research in the machine learning software, the uh, artificial intelligence inside. Part of what we are wanting to do is to see how much we can um, how much we can do in terms of some of the things that Danielle was talking about. Can we detect that a car swerved or came to a sudden halt and there was a pedestrian there, but there was no there was no collision, this near miss. The city of Portland, which is one of our early adopter cities, was interested, uh, is interested as we get more sophisticated hardware out there than, than is in there now, because we're also wanting to upgrade the processors. City of Portland said, we, we really love our bike uh, share program, but we're a bit concerned that people might be less likely or less frequently using um, helmets on the bike share than if it was a private bike. So they said, could you not just count the bikes, but tell us which ones are private versus the, in Portland, they're bright orange or red bikes, and whether the person's wearing a helmet or not so that they can say, well, it looks like we need to do an advertising campaign or somehow make it easier for people to use, uh, use helmets on, on those bikes. Um, the, the other transportation-related project is um, uh, 
one of the other ones is um, we have a small grant from the Illinois Department of Transportation to take a couple of the locations that we've got that are at at-grade crossings uh, because there's so many of these places in the city when a train's going through, it, just, um, it, it stops the traffic. And what they want to know is whether using the image processing we can give them statistics about at-grade crossings such as uh, not just when the gate goes down and comes back up, but after the gate goes back up, how long until the traffic returns to steady state, normal, and how many vehicles were involved and how many emergency vehicles were involved in that particular gate, we'll call it a gate uh, uh, event. And, and this would help them to figure out if they're going to eliminate at-grade crossings, which is an expensive thing to do, which ones would uh, make get the most bang for the buck, which ones are the ones that have the most uh, disruptive. Uh, so, so there are a lot of those kind of things that, that we can do with uh, related to transportation. Great. Um, so the speakers are kind enough to stick around for a little bit afterwards if you have some questions. Um, also, speaking of data, you can go to c2st.cnf.io and uh, give us your feedback on this program. We'd really appreciate it. And you'll be entered to win um, one of three tickets for the Morton Arboretum and some C2ST swag. Um, we want to thank our speakers. Domestic violence is a fight for power and control that can take the form of physical, emotional, sexual, and or financial abuse. At the Chicago Metropolitan Battered Women's Network, we believe no one deserves to be abused in any way. This issue is closely related to immigration justice, mental health, homelessness, reproductive justice, state violence, mass shootings, and systems of oppression such as patriarchy. In 2016, there were over 65,000 cases of domestic battery and 68 homicides in Illinois. At the Chicago Metropolitan Battered Women's Network, we believe no one deserves to be abused in any way. Join us in ending the violence. For more information, please visit our website. At Stay Lit Community Youth Services Program, our mission is to foster community relations in Auburn Gresham and focus on delinquency and violence prevention in an effort to improve the overall health and economic development of the community and the quality of life for all residents. We strive each day to collaborate with community partners to offer supportive services for youth, leading these young men and women to healthy, productive lives. For more information, please visit our website.